Hello and welcome to Lesson 12 of 20 in the URSA Campus Breakdown course on Introductory Statistics and Probability. This is Module 3, Random Variables and Probability Distributions, Part 2, Special Discrete Probability Distributions. Let's get started. In the previous lesson, we looked generally at discrete random variables and their probability distributions. And we focused in particular upon empirical probability distributions, which are typically based upon historical data. In this lesson, we turn our focus towards discrete random variables whose probability distributions are theoretical, based not upon prior experience, but rather on mathematical properties which define or model their associated probabilities. The topics covered in this lesson include theoretical versus empirical probability distributions, the uniform discrete distribution, the binomial distribution, and finally we look at infinite discrete random variables, in particular the geometric and Poisson distributions. Recall from the previous lesson the example of the person making three applications for jobs, where the random variable x equals the number of resulting job offers was distributed based upon prior historical evidence. For a situation like that, there's no particular natural law that would easily define the probability distribution of x. So we are reliant upon empirical data to construct a relevant distribution, which we then hope will provide us with an accurate tool for forecasting future probabilities. In other instances, we may be able to construct a more straightforward probability distribution based not upon previous history, but rather on the very nature of the experiment itself. If certain characteristics of the experiment dictate that probabilities are strictly defined, then the resulting probability distribution is a theoretical one. The following example illustrates this type of problem. In example one, a fair die is rolled once. If we let x equal the number showing on the die, then what is the PD of x? So to answer this, we start with the possible values for x, which are the numbers one through six. While it's possible to derive the PDX empirically based on the previous results from rolling the same die, a much more simple and commonly used method for determining the PDX is to invoke the fairness of the die. That's, that is to say, if the die is indeed fair, then each of the sides one through six will, by definition, have an equal probability of coming up when the die is rolled. In other words, the probability that x equals little x is the same for all six possible values, so this probability is one over six. And we can see in the table on the left on the slide, we have the uh, PDX where we have the values of X from one through six in one column, and then the probabilities are all one sixth. This is an example of a uniform discrete random variable, which is the simplest of all discrete random variables because all we need to know is how many possible values the random variable can take on in order to figure out the probabilities. In other words, for n values, the probability that x equals little x equals 1 over n for each value. The bar graph for a uniform variable like this is a set of bars of equal height equal to 1 over n. For this example, the bar graph looks as follows, and we see the uh, bar graph on the bottom right of the slide. We simply have the values of x 1 through 6 and the probability for each of these, the height of the bars is one over six. Notice as well that there are gaps between the bars. This could be a histogram if the random variable, random variable was ordinal or interval or ratio, but the numbers on a die technically are simply just labels. In other words, if, a, if the outcome of a die roll a single die roll isn't one, it isn't guaranteed to next go to two and then to three, et cetera, all the way through six. 
but the outcome can switch f f among any of the six numbers in any in any sort of order. So technically, this is a nominal random variable, and so we we um, we we use the spaces. We indicate spaces between the graphs. Um, we have spaces between the uh, bars to indicate this. In example two, a fair die is rolled four times. If we let x equal the number of times a three comes up, then what is the probability distribution for x? So to answer that question, a good starting point is to consider what is fixed in this problem versus what is variable. So what is fixed here, in other words, what's constant, what isn't under any uncertainty, but rather what is certain is that we know there will be exactly four rolls of the die. And we also know that each time we roll the die, the probability of getting a three, since it's a fair die, is constant and it equals one sixth. So what's variable here? Well, we have the random variable x, which is the number of times that we get a three when we roll those four, when we roll the die four times. And that can be any value from zero through four, zero, one, two, three, and four. In other words, <clears throat> since each roll of the die may or may not come up as three, then we could have as few as none of the four rolls come up three, and as many as all four could come up as three. So to find the probability distribution of x, we consider each possible value of x and calculate its corresponding probability based upon four rolls of the die with the probability of getting a three each time equaling one sixth and the probability of not getting a three equaling the complement of that, which is one minus one sixth, which equals five sixths. So on this slide here, we can see we've got ourselves set up to answer the probability for all of the values of x from 0 through 4. And we're going to use this box method that's worked well for us previously in order to try and work out um, these probabilities. So we start by, let's start with the probability that x equals 0. And if that's the case, you can see that the four boxes all have three complement underneath. In other words, we get for all four of the um, rolls of the die, we don't get a three. So we can see that the probability each time would be five over six. So that would be five over six to the power of four. Now, let's just, and now what we do with that is, let's leave this for a moment and let's just continue with the boxes. And we'll get back to, you'll, you'll see these probabilities in the front. Um, being multiplied in blue in front of the boxes, but let's just leave that aside for the moment and move on to the probability that x equals 1 through 4. So you can see that if x equals 1, we've got 1, 3, followed by uh, 3 non 3. So we've got 1, to the power, 1 over 6 once times 5 over 6 to the power 3. And then for x equals 2, now you can see we've got 1 sixth in two of the boxes. So we've got 1 sixth squared times 5 over 6 squared. And then we've got for x equals 3, now we've got 3 times we have 1 over 6 and 1 5 6. So we have 1 sixth to the power 3 times 5, times 5 over 6 to the power 1. And then finally for x equals 4, we have all 3s. And so it's just 1 over 6 to the power 4. Now, what are those numbers you see in front? Well, the thing is, if you think about it, um, for example, let's leave x equals zero for the moment, because in that case, you would just have non threes in all of the boxes. And so non four nine non threes in a row, that's just the same thing. But if we look at x equals one, and you've got this one three, and then the other three are non threes. If you think of that as a string, we don't need, the, it doesn't, it doesn't only or it, it doesn't only necessarily happen with the three at the front in the first box that can be in any of the boxes so essentially it's like rearranging a string if you look at the the next one below where x equals two you can see that we've got three two threes followed by two non threes and Again, those don't need to be in that same order. They can be mixed around. So where the threes and the non-threes are can be anywhere. 
So there we have to look at the number of ways of arranging those. And then when x equals 3, now we have three threes and one non-3. And then when we get to x equals 4, we have all threes. So if you remember the way we found arrangements of strings, like words, where we had uh, like some like objects so, or like letters, that we would times it by um, the factorial of the total number, which in this case would be 4 factorial, and then we would divide on the bottom by the, f the number of any identical um, uh, values or letters in this case, uh, or values factorial. And so that would give us the number of ways of arranging um, the boxes so that the all the possibilities of having whatever assortment of threes and non threes there are could be included. So we could see here that the number of ways of arranging the first one when x is zero, well, since they're all non threes, that's just four factorial over zero. Zero is the number of threes and there's none of them factorial, which of course is one. Zero factorial is one. And then we have four identical um, um, non threes in the sense that we have they're all non threes so we would end up timesing that one by four factorial over zero factorial four factorial which and and then and then remember that that ends up being the same as four choose zero so you can see to the right of the boxes for x equals zero the probability equals four choose zero times one six to the zero times five six to the fourth now there is no one sixth for that one but i've included one six to the zero because if you recall um, any number uh, any non-zero number to the power zero equals one so we can include that in there and it doesn't change our answer and it's actually very helpful to show it because it shows that we have no uh, threes and then for x equals one now we have four factorial divided by and we have one three so that'd be one factorial and three non threes so we would go four factorial divided by one factorial three factorial which is the same as four choose one so we've got we have four choose one times one sixth now it's to the one and five six to the three now you see that that what's happening is you can see the pattern now that uh, as we move down the list we we keep it becomes four choose zero, then four choose one, then four choose two, which is basically equal to four choose the number of threes uh, that show up in that particular scenario. And then we times it by one sixth to the power of however many threes there are. And then we times it by five sixths to the power of how many um, non threes there are. And then you can see the answers there. The, the, um, we end up with a denominator of 1,296. And we have these different numbers in the numerator, and we get the following probabilities, which is which in this case have all been rounded to uh, three decimal places. And we build the PDX from that, and then we can see that when we add them up, uh, add up the probabilities that they add up to one. In this example, each of the probabilities was calculated by looking at the situation as an arrangement of two kinds of objects, either threes or non-threes. This sort of calculation, you should have noticed by now, has arisen in several of the problems we looked at in the previous lessons on counting principles and probability. The probabilities generated for each of the possible values of x equals 0 through 4 follows a pattern which can be described as follows. The probability, we can summarize what we discussed in the previous slide um, in this way. In other words, we saw that the probability of x equaling each particular value of x, little x, is, e is simply equal to four choose little x times one over six to the x times five over six to the four minus x. The above uh, formula, this formula is called the probability distribution function of x, or the PDF of x for this particular type of problem. Generally speaking, a discrete random variable will only have a PDF that is a formula, such as the one above, if its distribution is theoretical, as opposed to empirical distributions whose probabilities are not linked to any particular formula. Different kinds of experiments yield different characteristic PDFs, each based upon the different key parameters of the experiment. 
The, this example with its PDF shown above represents one of the most common and important theoretical discrete probability distributions used in everyday applications and it's discussed in further detail in the slides which follow. In general, if an experiment has the following, a fixed number n of repeated trials and the outcome of each trial is either, and we call these, with, we use the quotation marks here because we don't necessarily mean success or failure as in a good or bad thing, but we use the term as sort of like an either or, it's sort of a binary um, situation where either one thing happens or another. So we'll, we'll generally use the terms success or failure. And if the outcome of each trial is independent of the outcomes of all other trials and the probability of a success is constant for each trial and we call that a little p and therefore the probability of failure is also constant and it equals 1 minus p for each trial and if we define x to be the number of successes out of the n trial so this is actually the random variable here then x is said to be a binomial random variable and the possible values for the random variable would therefore be all of the whole numbers between zero, which is the uh, minimum, the case where it, there are no successes, right up through the maximum possible number of successes, which is n, which is the number of trials. And then we end up with the PDF for that random variable x equaling as follows. It equals n choose x times p to the power of x times 1 minus p to the n minus x. Now the shorthand notation for this, you see the x and then the uh, tilde, the squiggly uh, line, and that's called a tilde, and then we have bin bracket n comma p, which is read as follows. We say that x is distributed, that's what the tilde means is distributed. x is distributed binomially with parameters n equals the number of trials and uh, little p equals the probability of a success for each individual trial. Notice as well that in the PDF function here above, you see that the exponents on p and on 1 minus p are x and n minus x. And if you add those two together, the x's cancel and you get a total of n. And that simply means that the number of successes, which is x, and the number of failures, which is n minus x, always has to add up to n. In other words, anytime you do the experiment, whatever the number of successes or failures are, and notice that just like this, the number of successes will range from um, 0 to n, and that's what we define x to be, so will the number of failures range between um, 0 and n as well. And so whatever the number of successes or failures you end up getting for any particular time you do the experiment, then the, the sum of the successes and failures always has to add up to the number of trials because every trial can only be a success or a failure. There's no third option in this type of an experiment. And that's why the exponents add up to n. In example three, we look at the previous example, again, where x is equal to the number of threes that come up in four rolls of a fair die. Now, for that experiment, we can state that x is distributed binomially with, a, with n equals 4 and p equals 1 over 6. That's little p. And so the probability distribution, the, the, the um, PDF for x is equal to 4 choose x times 1 6 to the x times 5 6 to the 4 minus x. So the resulting uh, probability distribution, the PD of x, is written again below. This time with an additional column, we will also include the CDF for x. And so now you see we've got the table where we've got the x values from 0 through 4 and we have the pro probabilities that we calculated previously and then the CDF is just the cumulative um, uh, distribution function and we can see uh, as, as, as usual as, as is uh, by definition that the sum of the probabilities is 1 and that the last, the value of the CDF for the greatest value of x, which is 4, equals 1. 
And then you see on the slide on the bottom right, the corresponding histogram that results. And you can see that the histogram uh, basically shows a rectangle for each of the values of x from 0 to 4. And um, the heights of each rectangle corresponds to the probabilities that we calculated for them. In the previous lesson, we derived the following formulas for the expected value, variance, and standard deviation of any discrete random variable. And you see the formulas on the slide. And the expected value of x is um, basically the weighted average of all of the x values. So it's the sum of uh, all of the x values multiplied by their corresponding probability. And then the variance is the weighted average of the squares of the deviations. So it's the sum of each x value subtract uh, the mean, uh, which is the expected value, uh, all squared times the corresponding probability. And then the standard deviation is equal to the square root of the variance. So. These formulas apply to all discrete random variables, whether their probability distributions are empirical or theoretical. But in the case of theoretical probability distributions, however, their mathematically defined nature means that there should likewise be particular formulas for expected value, variance, and standard deviation of x. These formulas will be unique to each different type of theoretical distribution. For a binomial random variable, the formulas for these descriptive statistics are as follows. First of all, we have the expected value of x, or the mean, which equals n times p. And this one should seem fairly self-evident, so that if you um, do a, a set of repeated trials that, that are independent and have an, an, a constant probability of success, that you would expect that the average number of successes should equal the number of trials times the probability of success for each trial. The other formulas are perhaps a bit less self-evident, but um, you see them on the slide. The formula for the variance of x is equal to n times p times 1 minus p, and the standard deviation equals the square root of n times p times 1 minus p. In other words, the square root of the variance. So in example four, we work out for the previous example where x is distributed binomially with n equals four and p equal to one sixth. We get the expected value of x equaling four times one sixth, which equals four over six or two thirds, which equals 0 0.6 repeated. And the variance of x is equal to four times one sixth times five six, which is equal to 20 over 36 which reduces to 5 ninths, which equals 0 0.5 repeated. And the square, the standard deviation of x is the square root of the variance, which would then be the square root of 5 over 9, which reduces uh, in exact form to the root 5 over 3, which then rounds uh, to three decimal places to 0 0.745. In general, the value of p has a significant impact upon the PDF of a binomial random variable for any given value of n. This is illustrated in the example below. In example five, we have n equals four, and we look at three histograms. So for all three histograms, n is equal to four, and we're comparing from left to right uh, the p-value of 0 0.3, 0 0.5, and 0 0.7, respectively. And you can see um, a few things become obvious. You'll, you'll notice, first of all, the, the histogram in the middle. When p is equal to 0 0.5, that means that your chance of success is exactly equal to your chance of failure. So your, your probably failure will be 1 minus p, which will also be 0 0.5. And so it shouldn't be a surprise that the histogram is symmetrical. In other words, you have an equal um, probability of, um, you'll have the mean of two in the middle there, that's the, that's the peak, and you'll have uh, probabilities that are of the same value on either side, um, equally distant from the middle value of two. And you'll notice that when P is less than 0 0.5, such as in the, the 
the histogram on the left when p is 0 0.3 you can see that the that will that will skew the histogram to the right when p is less than 0 0.5 and then vice versa that the histogram you see um, on the, the the third histogram on the one on the right you can see that when p is greater than 0 0.5 the histogram is actually skewed to the left the uniform and binomial distributions are prominent examples of distributions for finite discrete random variables such as the number showing on a die or the number of threes showing on a fixed number of dice respectively there are many situations, however, where the random variable of interest is infinite. In fact, we need not look far beyond the experiments considered above to find instances where the relevant random variable is by definition infinite. The following example illustrates such an experiment. So in example six, a fair die is rolled until either a one or a six is obtained. We let x equal the number of rolls required. And then we're asked in part A to derive the PDF of x, and then in part B to calculate the probability distribution, the PD of x, as far as necessary, rounding the P of x equal little x to three decimal places. And we'll talk a little bit more about what's meant by as far as necessary as we continue. So in part A, in order to derive the PDF of X, we should first consider the following. The experiment here proceeds with one roll of the die at a time until we get a one or a six, and that's when we stop the experiment. Now for each roll of the die, the probability of getting a one or a six equals two sixths, if it's a fair die, which simplifies to one third. And Therefore, the probability of not getting a one over a six is equal to one minus one third, which equals two thirds. Now, since there may or may not be a one over a six on any single roll of the die, then in theory, there's no upper limit on the number of rolls needed to obtain a one over a six. In other words, we could in theory keep getting numbers other than one or six. So because of that, the possible values of x, they, it starts with a minimum of one and then goes up to two and three, etc. But there's no, theoretically, there's no upper limit. Now, this last point about there being no upper limit poses a bit of a challenge to us in terms of answering part B, because the probability distribution table will need to be of infinite length, because as you'll recall, for a discrete random variable, we need a row for every value that x can take on. So to address this problem, let's consider the probability of each x value starting from the first value of 1. And we'll keep doing it until, hopefully, a general rule emerges. So we start with the probability that x equals 1. And we, um, you can see we're using the boxes here. So the probability of x equaling 1 is simply the probability of getting a 1 or a 6 on one roll. And then we would stop then. So you can see there's just the one box with the probability of one third. So the answer is simply one third. So the next value we look at is x equals two. And if x equals two, we would have two boxes. And the the now remember this this experiment always ends with either a one or a six. So it'll always end with a probability of one third. So we'll have obviously a two thirds. In other words, we don't get a one or a six for the first. Um, rule, and then on the second we get a 1 or a 6. So it'd be, the answer would be 2 thirds times 1 third. And let's just look at one more of these. If x equals 3, uh, now we'll have three boxes. And again, we'll, it'll, it'll end with a 1 or 6, which means a probability of 1 third. And everything before will, will not be a 1 or a 6, which will be a probability of 2 thirds. So in this case, we end up with 2 thirds squared times one third. So hopefully at this point, the pattern becomes clear to you. In general, the probability that x equals any value little x will equal, and you can see the boxes we can show generally, we've got, uh, we've got a total of x boxes, and the last one is a one or a six with a probability of one third. And the rest of them, which is x minus one, will 
be not one or six and we'll have the probability of two thirds. So clearly then we can see that in general, the probability of X equaling any value little X simply equals two, two thirds to the power of X minus one times one third. So we can now answer part B using the formula that we just derived. And the formula we just derived is that the probability for any value of X equals two thirds to the X minus one times one third. And then we can use this to fill up a, a PD table for X. And of course, the problem here is that since there's no upper limit on X, there's therefore no last row to the table. So in theory, this table is of infinite number of rows. It just keeps going. Now we need to get around this problem. So what we do is we simply select a level of precision. And in this case, let's round to three decimal places. And then what we do is we just calculate the probabilities for X values starting at one and then increasing until we eventually get to a number that rounds to 0, 0.000. Now we can see in the table that while X does go on infinitely, at X equals 18, we get the probability of x equal 18 uh, rounding to 0, 0.000. In other words, it rounds to zero to three decimal places. And this, is, this will therefore continue to be the case for all values onwards from 18. That's the way this works. So once you get uh, an answer that rounds to zero to your chosen level of precision, you can stop. So correspondingly, the CDF of x eventually reaches one or very close to, I mean, we've there can always be a little bit of rounding error, but generally speaking, it will eventually reach a rounded value of one. In this case, rounded to three decimal places. So it reaches that uh, at uh, X equals 19. Um, interestingly enough, when we're, even though we're getting 0, 0.000 and we start to see that at 18, there is still a non-zero value. It's just filling up decimal places after the third decimal place. So that's why you can see actually that the CDF of X uh, at 18, even though we show the probability as 0.000, uh, our cumulative distribution is still sitting at 0 0.999. Uh, but when we get 19, there's obviously a little smidgen uh, that's being uh, added on. And it's at 19 that we actually round to 1.000. So we would consider that to be where we actually um, stop. So to summarize, um, at x equals 19, we start to see the CDF equaling 1. And from then onwards, the CDF will round to 1.000 as well. So we stop there. Note that this truncated PD table is not meant to indicate that x is a finite random variable. In fact, the last row of the table shows that the table actually goes on and on downwards. And that's the dot, dot, dot. However, it is clear from the table that the probabilities of all values of X greater than 18 do not register probabilities above 0, 0.000 when we round to three decimal places. In general, if an experiment is made up of repeated independent trials such that the outcome of each trial is either a success or a failure, and the probability of success is constant for each trial, and we can call that P, which therefore means that the probability of failure is also constant for each trial, and we can call that one minus P. And if we repeat trials until there is a success, and if X is defined as the number of tri trials required to obtain a success, then X is said to be a geometric random variable with the possible values of X being one, two, three, and onwards and upwards with no upper limit as possible values. And we get the following PDF, the one that we derived on the, uh, previously, which is that the probability that X equals any value little X equals one minus P to the X minus one times P. The, short, the shorthand notation for this distribution is you see there the same notation that we used previously for um, the binomial, uh, and it's read as X is distributed. We use the letter G, and we say that X is distributed geometrically with parameter P equals the probability of success for each individual trial. 
For a geometric random variable, the formulas for expected value, variance, and standard deviation are as follows. The expected value of x is equal to 1 over p, which should seem self-evident, as with the binomial distribution. And the variance is equal to 1 minus p over p squared, and standard deviation equals to the square root of that, which is the square root of 1 minus p over p squared. And again, the variance and standard deviations probably aren't as self-evident as the expected value ones are. So in example seven, we can go back to the previous example where x is distributed geometrically with p equal to one third, and we get the expected value of x equaling one over one third, which equals three. The variance equals one minus one third over one third squared, which gives us two thirds over one ninth, which works out to six. And the standard deviation of x is the square root of 6, which rounds to three significant digits to be 2.45. Another commonly encountered type of random variable is one which models the number of occurrences of something in particular over a defined period of time or space. Examples of such random variables include the number of lightning strikes in a defined area over a year, the number of arrivals of customers at a shop during a business day, or the number of typographic errors on a page of printed writing. Predicting the number of occurrences of such events is generally more difficult than predicting such things as the outcomes of coin tosses or rolls of dice, because the underlying probabilities are not as clear with the former versus the latter. That is to say, we can easily define a coin as being fair. We can make that assumption, and therefore we can assign theoretical probabilities that the, prob that the probability of heads and tails are each equal to 0 0.5, for instance. With something like lightning, on the other hand, the factors influencing when and where it strikes are much more elusive to our understanding. So the approach we take to predicting such occurrences is, is to use a hybrid, a hybrid method, which combines elements of empirical and theoretical modeling. And it works as follows. Based on empirical evidence, which is typically historic, historical data that we accumulate, that we collect over time, an average number of occurrences over the defined period is determined. And then using this average number of occurrences, a theoretical mathematical model is used to generate a probability distribution for the random variable. This mathematical model is called the Poisson distribution. In general, if a random variable x equal the number of occurrences of a particular event over a defined period, if we define a random variable x this way, and if the possible values of the random variable are x equals 0, 1, 2, and so on with no upper limit. So we can have as few as zero occurrences and theoretically no upper limit on the number of occurrences. And if each occurrence is independent of all other occurrences, then we can say that x is distributed via a Poisson distribution. And you see how it's written above there on the slide. Uh, we use PN as the symbol for Poisson. And it has a single parameter. parameter. So we say that X is distributed as a Poisson uh, random variable with parameter lambda. That's the symbol you see there. Where lambda is defined as the mean number of occurrences over the period. So lambda is the average. So and you see lambda is the Greek, we use the Greek letter lambda for this. Um, there are others, sometimes uh, mu is used, other symbols might be used, but in this course we'll generally use lambda to represent the average number of occurrences. And the actual mathematical model that we get for the Poisson distribution, in other words, the PDF function for x is defined as follows. The probability of x equaling any value little x is equal to e to the power of minus lambda times lambda to the x divided by x factorial. Now, the Poisson formula has the special property 
that the sum of all of the probabilities from 0 to infinity equals 1. Of course, it has to. This is an absolute necessity for any probability distribution formula, as we've previously discussed. So the specific probabilities that this formula generates for a given random variable are only estimates, of course. Um, and we should keep this in mind as we use the model. Remember that we're, we're, we're using historical data and feeding it into this mathematical model for it. It has been generally observed, though, that the Poisson model tends to offer a fairly accurate and therefore useful predicting tool in many practical applications. The example which follows is one such relevant application. In example eight, we have a team of rangers hired to stand post at a remote forest fire lookout tower. Historical records show that in the previous 48 fire seasons, a total of 39 forest fires were spotted there. And then we're asked to calculate the following. First, we're asked to figure out the PDF for the random variable X, which is defined as the number of forest fires spotted over a single or one fire season. And we specifically are instructed to generate a table that goes as far as necessary with probabilities rounded to three decimal places. So we'll make sure to follow that specification. In part B, we're asked to find the probability that the rangers will spot exactly three forest fires in the coming season. In part C, we're asked to find the probability that the rangers will spot at least one forest fire in the coming season. And in part D, we're asked to find the probability that the rangers will spot at least one forest fire in the next three seasons. And in E, we're asked to find the probability that the rangers will spot at least one forest fire in the first half of the coming season. For part A, we let x equal the number of forest fires spotted over the coming season. This gives us x is distributed as a Poisson random variable with parameter lambda, where the possible values of x are 0, 1, 2, etc. In this example, lambda is calculated based on the historical data provided as an average number of fires spotted per season. We have 39 fires in the past 48 seasons, so therefore lambda equals 39 divided by 48, which equals 0 0.8125 fires per season. So this gives us a probability distribution function for x equal to e to the minus 0.8125 times 0.8125 to the power of x divided by x factorial. The resulting PDX is shown below, calculated as far as necessary with three decimal place precision. Note that the PDX table only goes as far as x equals 6, because from there onwards, the probabilities round to 0 0.000. And note as well that from x equals 5 onwards, the CDF rounds to 1.000. So we can stop at x equals six and we just include the last row with the dot 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 and all further probabilities are 0 0.000 and all further CDFs are 1.000. Now we can start to answer the rest of the parts of this question. So the probability, the answer for part B, the probability that the rangers will spot exactly three forest fires in the coming season is simply equal to the probability that x equals three. So we just plug three into the equation and we get 0.040, which you would also, you can also locate that once you've completed the PDX table, you, you don't need to do any more calculation. You would be able to just find that number. And so the answer is 0.040, which rounds to the nearest percent that rounds to 4%. The probability that, so part C is the probability that rangers will spot at least one forest fire in the coming season. Now that equals the probability that X is greater or equal to one. Now remember um, that that would be one probability of one plus probability of two and so on and so forth, which is an infinite sum. So the quickest way to handle that is to use this concept of the complement. So we just go one, one minus the, op the opposite, which is that x equals 0. So from the table, we just go 1 minus 0 0.444, which is 
which rounds to 0 0.556, which rounds to the nearest percent to 56%. In part D, we're asked to find the probability that rangers will spot at least one forest fire in the next three seasons. Now, for this particular problem, we do need to redefine the random variable so that it covers the relevant period here, which is three seasons instead of one. Now, and that's because the mean, the lambda value that we have is for one season. So we've got to be careful here. So what we do is we start by defining a new random variable. We'll call it Y here. So we say let Y equal the number of forest fires spotted in three seasons. Now, in general, if Y is equal to the number of occurrences in T periods, then lambda y is simply equal to t times lambda x. So in other words, um, your probability distribution, you can see in the slide here, ends up being the same Poisson uh, function, except we replace, um, we replace lambda, the lambda x, with the lambda y, and, and that equals to t times lambda x. So in this particular problem, we have t equaling 3. And so we simply, to get our lambda for y, we just times the <coughs> original lambda for x, which is 0.8125 by 3. And so we get 2.4375. That's the average number of, of, of fires in three seasons. And so our new function, our new probability uh, distribution function becomes e to the minus uh, 2.4375 times 2.4375 to the y divided by y factorial. Now, the question at hand here is the probability that the rangers will spot at least one fire in the next three seasons. So once again, we have the situation where we want the probability of the random variable y, in this case, being greater or equal to one. So once again, we can use the complement to do this in the most efficient way. So we only need to find the probability that y equals zero and subtract it from one. We don't need to redo a table here. We can just plug zero into the equation. Of course, um, when you plug zero in, the only you get one. Anything, any the lambda to the one to the zero will be one, and zero factorial is one. So the only uh, part that gives us a number other than one is just e to the minus uh, lambda. So we get the answer becomes one minus e to the minus 2.4375 which rounds to 1 minus 0 0.087, which rounds to a final answer of 0 0.913, which to the nearest percent is 91%. In part E, we're asked to find the probability that the rangers will spot at least one forest fire in the first half of the coming season. So to solve this problem, it's sort of similar to the last problem except instead of a longer period of time, it's actually a shorter. So now we're looking at half a season. So if we let, let's use Z here, and if we let Z equal the number of forest fires spotted in one half of a season, um, then the lambda for Z will equal 0.5 times the lambda for X. So one half or 0.5 times 0.8125. So we get lambda here of 0 0.40625. So that gives us a probability distribution function equaling e to the minus 0 0.40625 times 0 0.40625 to the power z divided by z factorial. So therefore, the answer to the question, which is the probability that the rangers will spot at least one forest fire in the first half of the coming season, is equal to the probability that z is greater or equal to 1. So it's similar to the last two problems in that we can work out the probability for z equaling 0 and then just subtract it from 1. So that gives us 1 minus e to the minus 0 0.40625, which rounds to 1 minus 0 0.666, which gives us 0 0.334, which rounds to the nearest percent to be 33%. For a Poisson random variable, the formulas for expected value, variance, and standard deviation are as follows. Now, we already know that the expected value of x is equal to lambda because we defined lambda as the mean number of occurrences or expected value. 
Interestingly, the variance is also equal to lambda, and therefore the standard deviation is equal to the square root of lambda. So in example 9, we can go back to the previous, previous example, part A, where x is distributed as a Poisson random variable with uh, lambda equaling 0 0.8125, and we get expected value and variance, therefore equal to 0 0.8125, and the standard deviation is the square root of that number, which rounds to three decimal places, to three significant digits, to be 0 0.901. The following set of practice questions is meant to provide a review of the material covered in this lesson. Question one, a fair coin is tossed until a tails is obtained. Calculate the probability that the coin is tossed at least three times. So to answer this problem, we start by defining X equals the number of tosses required to obtain tails. The possible values of x are 1, 2, etc., with no upper limit, which is a geometric experiment. So therefore, x is distributed geometrically with our parameter uh, p equal to 1 half because it's a fair coin. So therefore, our probability distribution function for x is equal to uh, 1 minus 1 half, all to the power of x minus 1, times 1 half which equals 1 half to the x minus 1 times a half. We have a common base of 1 half, so that all works out to 1 half to the x. Now here we're looking for the probability that the coin is tossed at least three times, which is the probability that x is greater or equal to 3. Now since there's no upper limit for x, the answer here is, is the same as the probability that x is 3 or 4 or 5, etc., with no end. So we need to use the complementary rule. So we say that this equals... 1 minus the probability that x is less than 3, which means that all we have to do is figure out the probabilities that x can be 1 or 2, and we subtract those probabilities from 1. So that gives us 1 minus, in brackets, 1 half to the 1 plus 1 half to the 2, which is 1 minus, in brackets, 1 half plus a quarter, which works out to 1 minus 3 quarters, which equals 1 quarter, or 0 0.25, or 25%. Question two, a market garden nursery claims that their cucumber seeds have an average germination rate of 90%. To test this claim, five of these seeds are sowed and the number of seeds that germinate are recorded. Assuming that this claim is true, calculate to the nearest percent the following. Part A, the probability that all of the seeds germinate Part B, the probability that none of the seeds germinate. Part C, the probability that some, but not all of the seeds germinate. Part D, the probability that more than half of the seeds germinate. And part E, the probability that if this experiment was repeated 10 times, more than half of the seeds would germinate each time. So to answer all the parts of this problem, we start by doing a few things that will help us for to answer all the parts. So we start by defining the random variable. Let x equal the number of seeds that germinate out of 5 sowed. So that gives us possible x values from 0, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Basically all the values between 0 and 5. So this is a binomial the way, this, the way this problem has been defined, we have a fixed number of trials and we have a, a constant probability of success each time of 0 0.9. So we can say therefore that x is distributed binomially with n equals 5 and p equals 0 0.9. So therefore the probability distribution function for x equals 5 choose x times 0.9 to the power x times 0.1 to the power of 5 minus x, which gives us the resulting PDX that we see on the slide. So we can see that we have all the values of x from 0 to 5, and the probabilities are calculated for each of those. And we see here that something that uh, can happen um, sometimes 
is the the probability column is supposed to is required to add up to one but when we're rounding and these are these probabilities are being rounded to three decimal places so it's possible um, it, it's quite normal to be off by plus or minus a small amount from one typically somewhere it could be somewhere around uh, you know point for three decimal places something like 0 0.001 in either direction so an answer of 0.999 or 1. 0, 0, 001 is 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 considered acceptable because it's simply due to rounding. It's an unavoidable situation if we round this way. So as it happens here, we get that column for probabilities adding up to 0 0.999, and that we consider that to be equal to one. Uh, do and simply it's simply close enough to one, and we we recognize that that's simply due to uh, unavoidable rounding. And also we can see that the CDF here actually um, comes out to um, comes out to 1.000, so everything looks fine. So now we have everything we need to answer all parts of the question. For part A, we're asked to find the probability that all the seeds germinate, which is simply equal to the probability that x equals 5, and we can get that from the table that rounds to 0 0.590 or to the nearest percent, 59%. For part B, the probability that none of the seeds germinate is equal to the probability that x equals 0, which from the table rounds to 0 0.000 or 0%. Now, it's not exactly equal to zero because as we've discussed previously for a binomial distribution there there is going to be some non-zero probability for all values from zero through n inclusive but in this case the probability is so small it's actually if we work it out until we get a non-zero we get 0 0.00001 but to three decimal places that just rounds to uh, zero for part C, we're asked to find the probability that some but not all of the seeds germinate, which is equal to the probability that essentially that we don't get zero and we don't get five. In other words, the probability that X is greater than zero and less than five, which is equal to the probability that X is greater or equal to one and less than or equal to four. Uh, the fastest way to do that from the table, we can just uh, take one minus the probabilities for the excluded zero and five values which gives us 1 minus the sum of 0 0.000 and 0 0.590, which works out to 1 minus 0 0.590, which rounds to 0 0.410 or to the nearest percent, 41%. For part D, we're asked to find the probability that more than half of the seeds germinate. Now, half of 5 is 2.5, and we, that's not uh, one of the values because X can only be whole numbers from 0 through 5. So the first possible x value that includes is 3. So we're looking for the probability here that x is greater or equal to 3. So we could add all of those up. But what we can also do here is, is use the complement uh, again and go 1 minus the probability that x is less than 3, which is the same as 1 minus the probability that x is less than or equal to 2, which is simply 1 minus the CDF of 2. And we can get that value from the table. That's 0 0.009 rounded. So our answer is 1 minus 0 0.009, which rounds to 0 0.991, or to the nearest percent, 99%. And finally, for part E, we want the probability that if this experiment was repeated 10 times, more than half of the seeds would germinate each time. So the simplest way to do this is just to see that uh, this is simply just the same as the probability uh, that we get the result from D, which is more than half the seeds germinate, to happen 10 consecutive times. So we can just use the answer, and we'll take the, we'll take the three sig figs, we'll take the 0.991, and we'll raise it to the power 10. And that gives us our answer uh, rounded to 0 0.914, or to the nearest percent, 91%. Question three. Over the last 107 years, there have been 185 recorded lightning-caused forest fires in a mountain forest area. Based on this historical data, calculate to the nearest percent 
and we're asked to do all the following. For part A, the probability that there will be at least one lightning caused forest fire in this area in the next year. For part B, the probability that there will be at most three lightning caused forest fires in this area in the next year. For part C, the probability that in the next three years there will be more than three lightning caused forest fires in this area. And for part D, the probability that in the next four years there will be more years with one or more lightning caused forest fires in this area than years without any such fires. So once again, for a problem of this type with several parts, we start by doing the setup work, which will help us to answer these parts. So we let X equal the number of lightning caused forest fires in this area during a single year, which gives us possible X values of one, two, uh, zero, one, two, and et cetera. And we can see this is going to be a Poisson random variable with lambda equal to, based on the historical data, 185 divided by 107, which rounds to four sig figs to 1.729 fires per year. So therefore, we can say that X is distributed as a Poisson random variable with lambda uh, equal to approximately 1.729, which gives us a probability distribution function for X that is equal to approximately e approximately equal to e to the minus 1.729 times 1.729 to the power x divided by x factorial and that gives us the resulting pdx that we see on the slide here and note that if we're rounding to three decimal places we get the probability e rounding to 0, 0.000 at x equals 8 and also note that the CDF rounds to 1.000 from 7 onwards so we can stop at x equals 8. Now we're ready to start answering the parts of this problem. So for part A, the probability that there will be at least one lightning caused forest fire in this area in the next year is equal to the probability that x is greater or equal to 1, which, as we've seen uh, previously for a situation like this, can be done by doing 1 minus the probability that x equals 0, which gives us 1 minus 0.177, which rounds to 0 0.823, or to the nearest percent, 82%. For part B, we want the probability that there will be at most three lightning caused forest fires in this area in the next year. That's equal to the probability that X is less than or equal to three. And we can take that right off the table. That's just going to be the CDF at uh, for X equals three, which rounds to 0 0.902 or to the nearest percent, 90%. For part C, we're looking for the probability that in the next three years, there will be more than three lightning caused forest fires in this area. So now we have changed the, the period from one year to three years. So we need to redo um, part of the uh, analysis. So we start with a new random variable. We let Y equal the number of lightning caused forest fires in this area during three years. So now Lambda is equal to 3 times 185 over 107 which to 4 sig figs rounds to 5.187 and therefore the probability uh, distribution for y is equal to um, approximately e to the minus 5.187 times 5.187 to the power of y over y factorial, which gives us the new PD for y that we see on the slide. And here, um, for, for, for the purpose of, of illustration, we uh, show the entire distribution up until um, we get the rounding to 0 for 0 0.000, 000 for the probability for the probabilities and uh, 1.000 for the CDF. And we can see here that 
The probabilities start to round to zero when y is 15, and the CDF rounds to 1.000 when y is um, 14. So we only need to go up to 15. And also note that uh, there's a rounding issue again, that the probabilities act, add up to, for the, for the ones showing add up to 1.001, which is within, um, sort of a, a, a acceptable or expected uh, rounding error that we get in this situation. So this, this looks good. So we're ready to continue. So now to answer the question, the probability that in the next three years, there'll be more than three lightning caused forest fires in this area. That is uh, the probability that Y is greater than three. And for that, we can, uh, we can, we can use uh, the complement rule, so that equals 1 minus the probability that y is less than or equal to 3, which is equal to 1 minus the CDF for 3, which on the table we can see is rounded to 0 0.240. So the answer works out to 1 minus 0 0.240, which rounds to 0 0.760 or to the nearest percent, 76%. Finally, for part D, we're asked to find the probability that in the next four years, there will be more years with one or more lightning caused forest fires in this area than years without any such fires. So this actually turns out to be a pretty complex problem compared to the previous parts, because as it turns out, this is a problem involving a Poisson random variable or, the, or within a problem with a binomial random variable. In other words, this is a Poisson problem within a binomial problem as follows. We are looking at four separate years because as the question, as the question says, we're interested in years, years with one or more lightning caused forest fires versus what is actually the complement of that, which is years without any such fires. So, Careful consideration of that wording will make it clear to us that we're, look, we're supposed to look at one year at a time. So what we have are four separate years. And each for each year, we can define, say, a success, so to speak, as that year having one or more fires. And so therefore, a failure, so to speak, would be a year without any such fires. So... That, those are the basic ingredients of a binomial problem. So let's define the binomial random variable. Let z equal the number of years out of the next four with one or more lightning caused forest fires. So z takes on possible values 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4. Uh, z is distributed binomially where n equals 4. That's the number of years we're looking at. And the last part which is perhaps the trickiest part here, is to figure out what that P, the probability of a success, the probability of having one or more lightning caused forest fires in this area in a given year. Well, that's actually something we worked out already in part A. That, that P value simply equals the probability that our previous X random variable is greater or equal to one, which we've worked out to be uh, rounded to 0 0.823. So, we can therefore, so we're ready to go in terms of setting up the overall binomial uh, distribution. Um, our, the probability distribution for Z is then approximately equal to four choose Z times 0.823 to the power of Z times 0.177 to the power of four minus Z using the rules for probability distribution formulas, functions. And that gives us the resulting PD for Z, which we can see on the slide. And we, we can see that the, we have the values of Z from zero through four and the probabilities add up to one as they should. And the CDF ends at one for the highest value z equals four so all is as it should be and we're ready to proceed to answer the question 
The probability that in the next four years there will be more years with one or more lightning caused forest fires in this area than years without any such fires. We need to in, we need to interpret that and translate translate that into what that means about what values of Z we're looking for here. If there's more years out of four than not, now that means more than half are years with one or more lightning caused forest fires. So we're looking for values of Z that are greater than half of four, which is two. So the answer to this question is equal to the probability that Z is greater than two. And one way we can do that, since Z greater than two is the complement of Z less than or equal to two, in other words, all we need to do is just take one minus the CDF for two, which from the table, that CDF for two is 0.147. So finally, we get the answer to this question equals 1 minus 0.147, which rounds to 0 0.853, or to the nearest percent, 85%. I hope that you found this video helpful. If you liked it and would like to see more from MRSA Campus, then please subscribe. And also, if you'd like to send your feedback, that's always welcome too. Thanks for watching, and I wish you well with your studies.